Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, AI Ops, Reactive to Proactive, Revolutionizing the IT Mindset, brought to you by the SNEA Cloud Storage Technology Initiative. This is Michael Horde, your host and facilitator for today's discussion. I work for Intel and I serve as chair for the SNEA Cloud Storage Technology Initiative. Today's conversation is with Pratik Gupta, Chief Technology Officer for IBM Automation. Hello, Pratik, how are you today? Hey, Michael, I'm doing great. Great to be here. Awesome. And uh, before we get started, I'd like, I want to mention the uh, SNEA, that SNEA is a group of about 200 industry leading organizations comprising of 2,500 active contributing members and 50,000 participating IT end users and storage experts worldwide. As one of the organizations within SNEA, the C CSTI is dedicated to education and promotion of the cloud stor storage technologies like AI at the edge, storage security and management, as well as driving understanding and collaboration among other industry associations. Now, now let's take a quick look at the SNEA legal notice. This provides SNEA's copyright notice regarding use of the material. There are no warranties expressed or implied. So if you want to reference this material, please do so at your own risk. You can download a copy of this presentation using the interface for this live webinar. The interface also allows you to submit questions during the talk and rate this presentation at the conclusion. We really appreciate your questions and feedback. For today's discussion, we will explore a more comprehensive view of AI ops. Pratik will share how AI ops is being transformed to address continuous improvement spanning the full development to deployment lifecycle. Additionally, his examples show how AI ops promotes more collaboration across teams, leading to AI powered automation. One final note, please submit questions at any time during the presentation. If we're not able to cover all the questions during the session, we will answer your questions in a Q&A blog, which will be posted after this webinar. So let's get started. Pratik, please take it away. Thanks, Michael, and hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Pratik Gupta, and I've been in the IT management industry for over 20 years. And I've been um, seeing the evolution of AI ops all the way from when it was called IT operational analytics to now how it's evolving uh, due to the rapid advancements in AI. Any vendor names I use are just examples. They don't constitute any endorsement from me and the material here does not represent the views of any specific company. So let us start. Um, well, what is AI ops and how did it come about? It, it's really all about how to deliver IT services more reliably. And that means meeting the service level agreements for the services with fewer outages and how to reduce mean time to recovery or mean time to resolution by using the power of AI. And traditionally what it's been doing is how do we pick up information from the operation side how do you then use that information, apply AI onto it, and then try and find predictively or reactively uh, the solutions to the problems? But let's step back a little bit. What are causing these outages? And there was a survey of ITIC in 2022 which said, you know, the, the most um, critical culprits here are security errors. The second one is human errors. The third one is software bugs. So we are seeing a number of these themes, and obviously interesting, the fourth one is complexity, which, which is important as well as we talk about this. So there are lots of these things which cause outages. And what we're really trying to do is build the technologies using AI to prevent these or resolve these um, as fast as possible. Now, the term AI ops was, I believe, coined by Gartner. And it's interesting to see where the AI ops platforms technology is in the hype cycle. Most of you may be familiar with this and it's actually in the trough of disillusionment. And the reason is why, if this technology had so much potential, why is in this trough? And if you step back and look at um, some of the things we have learned, right? One of the reasons 
uh, they have not been as successful in the way we've been thinking about it is it's considered as part of ITOM or IT operations management. That means a small narrow segment of the end to end IT management and develop software development life cycle. And, and that's one of the reasons why it is, it, it is not as successful as it could be. The second reason is considered a tool. And we all know that tools on their own don't succeed. They require people transformation, process transformation to get to the full holistic advantage. And AI ops is one of them, um, which is uh, very important, uh, which requires people and process transformation. The third reason it has not been successful is a lot of focus has been to detect problems and solve them, not to prevent problems, a more reactive approach. And as we will see, it's important to become proactive using AI. Reactive approaches are not going to deliver the ROI uh, expected. And the final one is technology is complex. Um, AI ops generally require uh, setting up of, of a data platform with all the data sources, um, dealing with the scale of data and the number of events which are necessary which and also you know the evolution of ai has been slower in this area causing high false positives so let's look at what actually is evolving in this area now another point of check is is, is cost of defect the earlier we find the defects using ai the lower the cost the less the implications the less the the outages or or, or, or the cost of outages so very important and here you see why pigeonholing area ops into purely the operation side was not a good idea. And hence, we are moving towards left or a shift left of AI, as we will talk about. So the big transformation, the old AI ops was on the operate side of the life cycle. The new areas we are emerging is the shifting left of flying of uh, AI and ML across the life cycle, all the way from how do you plan, build, test, release, deploy, and then operate. So you're going to be talking about today the whole life cycle and how AI is actually impacting all those areas, and then what's the value and 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 the uh, amount of um, uh, improvements we get uh, by doing that. So the old definition should for artificial intelligence for IT operations, a technology that uses machine learning and analytics to automate IT operations, and the new definition is AI for IT is a set of processes that facilitate operational excellence and continuous improvement. And that's a very important part that we need to continuously improve the technologies and the processes. It's not just an implementation of a tool across dev and IT and a set of technologies. Some of these are not available as tools. These are technologies we will have to implement in our environments, a set of tools which are available and a set of practices or best practices, I should say, that leverage AI and ML for delivering the, the superior reliability outcomes we are looking for. And because it's across the software development and operations lifecycle, it has to be collaborative across the people who exist in complete life cycle. So let's look at a, a bird's eye view of how is AI being applied to the various aspects of this life cycle, starting with the bottom left, right? the planning side, how do you build code? For people who are writing code, you know, it's very important to build the code um, by taking into account how it is gonna be operated. And one of the things we wanna do is build modular services, the whole notion of microservices as it's evolving and reducing complexity. Well, what's happening is AI is now beginning to write code. And we'll talk about AI for code gen and how AI can actually help you review code. Is it modular? Is it secure? Is it, you know, how are the test cases for it? We'll talk about that. The second aspect where AI is coming in is change risk assessment. If there is a change made to the code, whether it's a, a fix or whether it's an enhancement, well, how risky is that change? Do I need more um, comprehensive test cases or it's the minor change? It can go through with minimal um, change board approval, minimal testing. How do we assess that? Security testing, both in static testing, dynamic testing, um, and we'll talk about how security is now being woven into the whole fabric of the life cycle and how AI is enabling testing of code for security. And then we'll talk about the shift left of observability, how observability and monitoring tools are expanding and broadening to measure 
pipelines to measure uh, all of the aspects uh, beyond just the operational side and how they deliver uh, predictive alerts. And then, you know, the traditional uh, an area of dynamic tuning and optimization is also new. And what it means is if you deploy the application into a virtual environment or into cloud, there are now more analytics and AI tools available which dynamically resize and reposition the workloads. And we'll talk about that to make sure they're fine-tuned to deliver um, the services, which reduces the alerts you may have gotten earlier, running out of memory or running out of storage or compute capacity is not enough. And those kind of things are now predictively handled and dynamically handled. And then we'll talk about event alert and reduction. Most of the tools, traditional tools sit here, which allow you to do clustering and root cause analysis. And then we'll talk about how AI is being used for automated remediation. So with that as a sequence, let's dive in and go a little bit deeper. Um, most recently, all of you have heard of large language models. Uh, this growth of ChatGPT, the growth of many other models. And out of that has come the ability for these AI models to generate programs, generate code. And one of the things uh, these programs are able to do is take prompt input from a user and write the code. In fact, we are seeing some excellent results um, from tools like Watch and Code Assistant or Star Coder, and then many, many tools like that where you can give uh, a prompt with the definition or description of what you want the model to write, and it will write code in the language of your choice. And then you can iterate on it by asking to refine it. And so, so there's a huge set of experiments, and I think some of it is even in production where these large language models are writing code um, instead of a, you know, an entry-level programmer for now, and that is going to evolve. Uh, one of the more interesting aspects of this technology, of this generative AI technology, is its ability to not only write code, but simultaneously produce documentation, produce test cases. You can, you can even train it to write more modular code based on your company's standards of modularity. You can give it existing code and it'll explain to you what the code does if you have a new programmer coming in looking at the code. Um, code modernization, you can give it legacy code. It'll produce new code. For example, um, there's an ability for code to take COBOL and produce Java equivalent code out of it, and that's being experimented on. Test case generation, including coverage analysis. And, and so, you know, this huge, huge evolution taking place, and what this is doing is allowing you to produce code in a more standardized manner. Certainly, huge productivity gain, but also what's being produced is much more standardized and testable, and the test cases are produced along with it. So what we are seeing is, you know, uh, an improvement um, in productivity, and we're talking, you know, the, the model being between 30 to 80 percent accurate in generating the code. There's still some work left to get it perfect for more complex use cases. But for you know most use cases, it is being it is working really, really well. And so we'll see a next few years a huge evolution in how code is being written, the quality and how it is being used to prevent security problems and basic programming problems early in the life cycle. Now let's look at the second big change, which is about you know build and, and test and you know going through change approval boards. So let's say you know um, some changes made, some code fixes are done. Well, how do you know this change should be checked in? What kind of approval does it need? Does it require very specific processes for testing? So what's happening is um, the new AI change risk modules, and, and and these are things which are not product yet, but they're getting there and a lot of companies are building services code for this, are looking at your past problems in your IT service management tools and saying, okay, which code modules produce the most amount of problems and incidents? And what they're seeing is, okay, what changes were checked in into GitHub and they're correlating. Are these changes for these very specific modules which are critical? or which have a high propensity for problems, and then routing that change to different sort of processes. A very high risk change may require different levels of approval, more rigorous testing, and more code reviews versus, you know, a simple change, which is a low risk in a module, which is not as critical, can flow through process A, which is faster. So, you know, understanding 
where the change is, what module the change is in, what's the criticality, is allowing you to do far more intelligent uh, understanding of the test and the change risk assessment cases. That's actually improving productivity, but also catching bugs early because now um, most people may not realize this is a critical module change. Let's go do some uh, critical testing on it. And there's a huge amount of work going. There are some references in the back of the deck which point you to some companies which are building modules um, like this. Um, let's look at the third aspect um, of this, which is really security testing. You know, security has become critical in today's world. And we did see from that survey that security problems are the number one reason of outages these days. So um, there are many types of security testing which can be done. Uh, the three most critical ones are static application security testing, which is really about um, code scanning. And, and this code scanning is about things like, you know, buffer overflow or SQL injection or cross-site skip stripping, you know, those kind of errors which are introduced into code. Um, so how do you do static testing? Dynamic testing is all about black box testing, you know, you, you run the code, you test the code, and then composition analysis is about you know, what modules are there in the code. So what's happened is that AI is now being injected into a number of tools. And what these tools are doing is allowing you to not only run through the, the standard set of scans, but also do a lot more contextual testing, understanding what's in the code, helping people write custom queries for testing specific vulnerabilities so that you can prompt the code for testing. Go uh, tell me, is this kind of vulnerability in the code or is the code allowing this access? And you can start writing very specific code and the code gen will write the code. You can do API testing. So here, not only is the large language model looking at what APIs are present, but then now you can actually write code to dynamically test um, those APIs and look at coverage. And, and there are tools um, which, which test for, you know, there's one of the, the project called Open Worldwide Application Security Project, where the black box testing um, looks at various vulnerabilities while running the code, um, including AI to detect brute force attacks, AI driven, um, you know, autonomous testing. So there's a huge amount of advancement taking place in very recent years on how to dynamically test um, for uh, vulnerabilities in code. Now, this is a, a, an early set of technologies. We will see huge advancements in this area uh, of security testing. Um, shift left observability. Now, this is a huge shift taking place uh, where observability tools are looking at CI CD pipelines. They are looking at test environments. They're looking at compliance. And if you look at all the major vendors, whether it's in Stana or Datadog or Dynotrace, all of these vendors, you are seeing functionalities for a security instant or compliance being part of the solution. And this is very important that, you know, what we are seeing is these tools expanding its scope and, um, you know, going and handling the full life cycle. And you will see more and more um, set of things these tools. So today, most tools are looking at logs, traces, and metrics. Um, just a few years ago, they were mainly focused on traces and metrics. Um, you see most of the tools doing anomaly detection and predictive alerting. And this is looking at, you, you know, putting in AI and seeing abnormal behavior because the, the, the product has learned what is normal behavior for the product. Um, on the other side, some of the transformation taking place are that the development environments, the integrated development environments are now integrating observability tool plugins. And this is so that the developers who are writing code can at the same time use the plugin to see how is this code actually running in test or in development and start correlating the fixes with, with the performance. And so you are seeing the evolution of a brand new area called developer native observability, where IDE tools like VS Code and, and others have plugins for looking at actual function data. Now, if you think about um, DevSecOps teams, which are really responsible 
end to end, this is really what they need is to be able to go into code when necessary and look at the operational code when necessary. And this is quite mature, their commercial products doing it. And this is really the major tool which SRE tools are moving to just to make their life easier and look at a more holistic view of, of, of observability. Now, we can see pipelines, we can see performance. Some tools are even putting in business processes, which the applications are running. So a link to how the businesses are doing. Uh, the, and there's also the notion of how uh, um, financial transactions are flowing through the code. So what's the impact to financial transactions if certain transactions are not going through? So these really are broadening the field, understanding everything from the business impact to the developer side to the production side, huge evolution taking place um, in this industry. Um, dynamic tuning and optimization. This is a, a, a new area also called cloud cost optimization. And this is the bridge between FinOps and IT operations. And so imagine um, you've written some code and, uh, and, and, and the, the platform engineering team says, okay, how much do you need in the cloud to run this piece of code? Do you need a large computer or a smaller one? How much memory do you need? And oftentimes most people have no idea. And, and so the, what this, is, this technology is doing and that tools like um, uh, Turbonomic, cloud cost optimization tools, many kinds, even um, the vendor like Amazon and others are building these dynamic tools where these tools dynamically look at a module executing in cloud under load in production and are able to recommend how to change the memory in those elastic environments or CPU or uh, place um, these workloads in different um, virtual machines or even change the heap size. And on the right, you can see um, some of the recommendations you see from these tools which say, okay, you know, you need to um, resize down virtual memory because this is not a memory intensive application. And, and you can and, and you can see, you know, picking the SSD versus spinning disks, uh, which cluster to put it on. So very high level of optimization uh, in terms of running the application um, correctly. Now, as a side effect, um, from an operations perspective, you think about how many alerts are generated just because you're running out of CPU or running out of memory, you're running out of storage space. Well, all of those are now being dynamically handled by some of the tools and they're pretty mature in the area. And if you're working in the cloud, the purchase of reserve instances, which is really the pre-purchase of resources that are discounted price, uh, it's a commitment to use them can be uh, handled by these tools which say, okay, um, depending upon the workload, you should keep this many reserved instances purchased as the most optimal number. Uh, so there's a huge amount of financial optimization and performance optimization uh, possible uh, with these, these kind of tools. So a huge evolution taking place um, in this area as well. Um, looking at more um, monitoring and operations side of the business, uh, this is the traditional event management, event reduction capability. These tools have been around for a while, uh, but what's happening is the quality of deduplication or the quality of clustering, uh, which they're able to do to get down to root cause. Um, most of these tools are able to pinpoint uh, the infrastructure where um, the, what is the root cause of the alert or event. They're able to look at seasonality and adjust on the normal operating band from a performance perspective. They're able to do root cause detection. They're able to look at um, seasonality. So for example, you have a sales season coming up during one of the big holidays. You know the load is gonna be big. You know that there will be higher utilization of resources. There's no need to alert until it gets to, you know, really the critical level to so understanding how applications behave seasonally, how to suppress events based on those anomalies versus uh, detecting, you know, really the root cause. Um, these tools are becoming better and better, and there are lots of tools in the industry um, 
from event management perspective, which have been around for a while. But the new evolution here is understanding root cause by following the alert pattern and the uh, and it's called the graph analysis uh, to determine where the root cause of the alert is. This is another area from an AI-based remediation perspective. Um, we, we saw that um, large language models and, and code gens are able to produce code. Well, uh, a number of areas where what's going on is these models are being used to, to look at potential problem tickets, identify which run books are the closest um, which will do the job of remediating and then modifying the run books for this particular case. And this modification can be with um, the human being in the loop at giving it guidelines or in some cases even um, automatically uh, using digital employees. And we'll talk about that uh, in, in, a, uh, in a few minutes. So what's really happening is the problem incident description, which has been opened, um, is going to the large language model. It is looking through the potential run books. Uh, it may or may not find the exact one, but it's also looking at close enough ones which could do some of the tasks. And um, one of the, these tools can then generate the run book. I mean, you should look at um, some of the work going on in open source in, in, in things like Ansible Lightspeed, which is really about taking Ansible code and, and looking through your library and then generating Ansible code for automating certain tasks in the area. And this is happening um, currently early in the process, but what, what, what this is, has a potential for evolution to do huge amount of AI-based uh, remediation uh, in its case. Um, so if you, you looked at the whole life cycle in terms of where AI is, how it's being applied, some of the tools are there and there are references of the tools at the bottom. Let's look at the next aspect of it in terms of now, what does it mean from a people and process perspective? There's a huge um, collaboration across boundaries is necessary and job roles are converging. Um, traditionally, the job of uh, a developer, the job of um, a deployment person, the job of IT operations was quite siloed. And the emergence of dev DevSecOps and SREs is really changing the way whole, a whole IT landscape um, is operating. Um, so what really is, um, is, is going on is the emergence of AI-enabled developer observability platform, which is really about how a developer is um, using information across the life cycle to fix problems. Or the site um, recovery engineers, or site reliability engineers uh, are using information both from um, developers and operations to recover the service faster. That requires a collaboration across the board. And in fact, most teams are blurring the line on the job roles. In fact, when I ran cloud teams, um, the developers had to do their stint through SREs. There were SREs on call for some periods of time before they went back into development. So those roles um, were uh, uh, reversing. Um, cybersecurity and AI are changing how security is being done. And, and that means that the security operations person is now part of the full end-to-end um, -end development and operations person, hence DevSecOps, that the person is doing a role for security, is doing a role for developments, and those roles are converging. So if you have different teams, um, which were siloed earlier, the modern way of running them is to start putting them together, building cross skills across the teams, having them do all of the life cycles uh, across development to production to security. And similarly, um, there's a convergence of tools taking place um, across the board, and you can see that these common platforms are, uh, are emerging, which are bringing the developers um, closer to the operations people with AI injected all the way. And there's a shared understanding of the processes, and they're making roles more collaborative. So there's a huge shift taking place in how companies are structuring their teams, the tools and the platforms they're using, and then the processes they're bringing together. Um, 
There's a question uh, on the previous slide which talked about runbooks. Well, runbook is a concept where you keep a set of scripts ready available in a library to fix a certain set of problems which are repetitive. So for example, you could have a runbook to restart an application, or you could have a runbook to um, deploy something. You could run have a runbook to reboot a server. Um, these are frequently used tasks which you codify into a set of scripts or an application, which an operations person can run very quickly to fix an issue. So these, these are called runbooks, and, and, and most companies have hundreds of runbooks. And what we try and do to make recovery faster is the operations people look at the problem and try and figure out, do I already have a script which allows me to take these set of actions quickly, already codified because somebody has seen this before and written a, a, a script to fix the problem. And what we generally find is that most of these runbooks are 90% correct or 95% correct. And there's this little change necessary, which which today they do manually and then they do it. And, and really the, the emerging technology is that even a book which is 90, 95% correct, the AI can make the rest of the changes and, and then the operations person can run it to fix the problem. And, and so really, um, you know, these are the, think of it as standard operating procedures for operations to quickly recover things when things break down. Okay, so we talked about, um, you know, the set of technologies which are available from depth to operations. We talked about what's really happening in collaboration um, across the boundaries and people. Um, let's look at automating everything. And this is really key to building resilient systems or building um, systems where for the most part, um, automation takes care of things. Um, Automate everything is the model most cloud operations teams use. What means is that whenever they see a problem, um, people try and write an automation script for it and they keep it so that the next time it happens, it automatically is taken care of, which means as little human intervention as possible. Um, we saw automation um, take all the way from code generation, how people write code. We saw automation in terms of functional security testing. And before these new tools, people had to manually run security and functional test tools. And now you're seeing test case generation and test code generation, um, taking uh, automation and doing it as part of the development and delivery pipeline. Um, you're seeing code review testing where the AI is looking at code, determining the risk, you're seeing you know, which process to use. Obviously, um, tools uh, like Jenkins and others already do deployment, but then operations tools in terms of automating the fine tuning of, uh, of, um, of resources, um, moving the workloads necessary based on these things. So now really comes the really advanced part of AI, which is just coming to play, which is called digital assistance. Um, if you haven't seen this, um, there's a very nice link to, uh, I believe it's called um, uh, Cognitive uh, Labs. Um, and, and what they have got are digital assistants. Um, IBM has got some digital assistants where these are AI entities or AI employees, you could call them, which can do far more sophisticated um, uh, jobs. Uh, so, so, so this employee called Deb and, is able to do bug fixes. Given the description of the bug, the code, the AI assistant is able to go inside the code and fix or do jobs, toil jobs to do perform very specific actions. And what these tools are doing is, it's really automating the basic tasks of um, doing sequence of things. There are other digital assistants coming up both in terms of you know booking trips and stuff, but these ones which actually fix code and do other things of IT are most interesting because you know that is really automating the end-to-end -end process of how code is is put into production. And then there's a lot of implications of this, specifically in terms of um, velocity of code delivery, the quality of code in conjunction with the velocity, and and so on. Um, so let's look at an example of what is possible today if you look at these technologies. 
Um, so let's take an example. A developer uses AI-based code generation to create a microservice and checks in the code. Uh, very typical from a development standpoint could be code for anything. Um, the automated build pipeline gets kicked off because you checked in the code. The AI enabled security testing tests the security and identifies as a package that was included in the code, which has vulnerabilities. Um, so, okay, so in the traditional environment and the build without those uh, AI enabled tools, that might have been missed. And so now the automated pipelines are able to say, oh, this is a back level package. Let me bring in the latest version of the package and rerun the build. And so what happens is, you know, the automated testing can actually upgrade the package, read on the build, and the build breaks. Pretty typical, right? If you bring in new code, uh, and the reason the build breaks is there was an API change in the package. So guess what? Today, the AI-based code assistants can actually update the code and change the code to use the new set of APIs. Now, this is within limits. It's early code. But for most traditional things, it is possible to have the AI assistant, especially things like star coders or watch and code assistant, just update the code and start using the new APIs, provided there is obviously that information available um, in your program to use the new API. And the whole process can actually get rebuilt. Uh, now, now, the change risk assessment could say, OK, this is a, a high risk change. Uh, we recommend a code review and additional testing. And now you can use some of those additional testing tools um, which, which, and test coverage test cases to go ahead and, and run the automated test cases produced uh, by CodeGen, which was done, and, and go through a much more rigorous form of testing than you would have normally and make sure that the coverage of the new change is correct, it is producing the right output, there are no security tests, and then you deploy it. Um, so let's look at what happens when you deploy it. There was additional memory needed. So the AI-based tuning tools deploy it with additional memory resources. And guess what? Why was additional memory needed? There was a memory leak. So the new developer observatory platforms can predictively tell you that there is a memory leak. Not when it actually crashes the system, but the fact that it's watching the memory going without increasing any load. And these predictive alerts say, OK, uh, the developer needs to fix another part of a code where there was a memory leak. And, and obviously, with the help of the digital assistant, you can fix that piece of code, um, automate the pipeline to build, restart, and deploy it with confidence. Now, think about it. In this process, how many potentials were there for errors which would have gone through earlier versus now with a much more end-to-end um, -end application of AI, how you've avoided the actual problem um, as opposed to um, you know getting it, letting it get to the end uh, in operations where you may have to find the root cause. Is it code? Is it the memory? Is it the deployment? Which part of these issues can have uh, have an issue? So in conclusion, now AI ops has evolved into you know AI everywhere, and you can see it from end to end where the technologies are developing. You've seen the job roles are converging, and more and more you're going to see enterprises bringing these teams together and people having um, a lot more end-to-end um, -end responsibility rather than just being one focused responsibility. And that's going to cause some issues but the, in, in terms of people and how they feel comfortable with. But that's happening certainly in the cloud area and more and more even in on-premises companies which want to run their data centers as private clouds. Um, there is the need for continuous improvement of process and removal of silos. And that's really to make this end cycle more efficient. And it's really got to do with how we actually build automation in. We find that you're having more uh, problems in certain area of the business. You need to do certain restarts, deployments. You know, how do you automate that so that next time the automated run books take care of issues without a human being being involved in fixing it? And now problem avoidance is another area in terms of root cause analysis. How do we get the problem detected much earlier in the life cycle, uh, whether it's is the code design, whether it's the security testing, whether it's you know the, the, the change risk assessment, and how do we shift left to avoid the problem? And then what's actually left in operations is really 
the unexpected issues, things like failures which could not have been predicted because of hardware or because of external circumstances. And that's really what's going to be necessary to make all of these environments highly reliable, uh, is to catch the problem early, use AI tools wherever possible to standardize, increase collaboration between the teams, and think of it as an end-to-end -end process, not just a tool um, called AI Ops. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Pratik. Uh, this was excellent. And uh, we do have a couple questions here. So um, first question is, how should a person start on the AI ops journey? Um, that's a great question. Um, a feed like this, there are many, many areas, many, many tools, many things to do. So what do you do first? I think the first step is to understand your own environment and where do you see most of the problems and issues originating? And you can do that by looking at your past history in your service management tool set and say, you know, in the past six months, most of our problems were in this part of the business. We did not do security testing enough, or we did not do change risk assessment enough. Or so identifying where the, the big cluster of problems are. The second step is to look at that area in detail and say, what processes do I need to change to make the review early, earlier, to make sure that these things don't slip through? And along with now the processes, what tools can help me make sure I understand what's going through? So it starts with measuring which small segment do I need to fix? Don't fix the whole problem, it's too big. Find a small area which has a big impact, find the process changes, find the tools specifically for those, implement the tool, measure the change at the end and see, did it improve? Go back again and see, okay, have we dropped that, not no longer being the most critical area, what's the next most critical area I need to go fix? So it's gonna be an iterative process and each of the processes are gonna require you to understand where the problems are first, what process changes do I need? And then what tools do I need to help along with the process changes? That's the methodology I have seen work. Buying a tool just because um, somebody claims that tool is great at fixing problems is probably not going to be the, the recommended answer here because you know that's, that is not really the first step. First step is understanding where and what process changes. Excellent. Uh... Yeah, thank you. And then um, what is the ROI for AI ops? Um, this is a very good question. And in some ways, it's not an easy question to answer. And the reason is, if you look through the end-to-end -end life cycle, what is the cost of avoiding a problem is different for each company. Number two, if you improve the processes, how do you know you actually avoided the problem, which you actually did by improving the processes? So that's not a measurable area. Now, there is data more on the operations side, and that has to do with, you know, uh, how much time did it take? So, for example, developer observability platforms and observability platforms would catch problems early. Uh, there is data which shows that, you know, you, you have at least 157 to 160% return on investment on the tools and the way this this comes about or the way this is measured is how long did it take for you to detect a problem and then how long did it take to resolve the problem which the tools helped in so both detection and resolution times are taken into account the cost of an outage is taken into account and that gives you about 150 to 160 percent improvement but these numbers are changing drastically because of the changes in AI because the quality of the tools, because you know the implementation of AI across the board is actually um, you know making the cost less and less for an outage. So huge ROI for sure. The measurement is getting tougher and tougher because of uh, you know all the different things which play into measuring the ROI. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I want to thank the audience. We've got uh, quite a few more uh, questions here. Um, so first one, uh, another one is, uh, how do you 
align your AI ops objectives with with your company's overall AI usage policy when it is still fairly restrictive in terms of the AI use and acceptance? Ah, excellent question. And this has to do with the governance of AI. You know, what, what exactly are the guide rails for AI? Are you allowed to use AI, for example, um, to look at your code? Or, or which AI uh, can you use to look at the code? So the way to do this is to first understand um, which part of your life cycle um, needs this AI capability. And let's take CodeGen as an example. Um, which companies have very good governance? So when you get a piece of um, AI technology which says, I am able to generate code for you, what are the license terms in terms of the usage of your data? And what you really don't want is open-ended terms which can use your code and data and put it out in, in public domain. So there are lots of companies coming up where you have very strong governance models where you can apply um, AI with uh, indemnity from the, the producing company, which says we will not use your data across it. And um, this whole um, data indemnification um, governance is an, a very critical use. And these tools are now coming about. Pick those companies, pick those tools, try them out. Um, there will be, um, and you will have to get them approval in, in your overall corporate guidelines for AI. But those are, believe me, they are coming right now in the industry with very strict guidelines where, you know, for enterprise use. And, and, and um, I do know some companies which have uh, these policies for indemnification and, and, and use, and those can be used for building code or testing code. Uh, but in some areas, it's very nascent. Some areas, it is not going to be easy for you to find the tools with the policy, but they are coming very fast. And I suspect in 2024, you're going to see a huge number of tools with these um, AI governance um, built into these tools um, uh, for your uh, protection. So, so that's happening, and you, you should align those policies for sure. Uh, I think that's a great question, and that's a great best practice as well. Awesome. And um, I'd like to combine two of the questions here. Um, what are the best AI ops tools in the market? And then how and what kinds of uh, coding and tool experience is needed for AI ops? I see. So, so remember, um, if you look at the presentation, there is no one tool. Each of the uh, life cycle areas has uh, a set of tools. Um, do I believe there's going to be one integrated tool set end to end? No, I don't think that's going to happen in the industry. But what will happen is um, there will be a, a set of leaders in each place. For example, security, um, there are a number of tools. Which are here. Now, I'm not going to endorse any specific tool in this webinar. That's not my, my job here. But I think there are enough um, um, tools where you should look at the area, security testing area, which are the best tools in that area, or observability tooling, which are the best tools in that area, or operations and event management tools. There are these sections, and I've split up the presentation in those sections by design that each of those sections are going to have a set of tools which are really specializing in those. So pick an area, do a Google search, go look at the references I've put in the presentation to give you an idea what's there. By no means am I endorsing any tools, but there are certain uh, very good tools emerging in a lot of these areas. And I would go section by section and pick the tools, not try to pick one tool which does everything. There isn't one tool which does everything for you, unfortunately. Okay. And um, you might have covered this, but if you um, uh, want to speak further on it, it's uh, how does a DevOps engineer gain more skills uh, getting into AI ops? Oh, uh, that is an excellent, excellent question question. Um, the, the, the bigger skill the DevOps engineers need is, you know, AI ops as a concept, AI ops as a process, and AI ops as a tool. There are three very specific skills they need to understand. Let's start with AI for the concept. That is the understanding of the DevOps engineer as to where can I apply AI in the job I do today to help improve the time to resolution. It could be root cause analysis. It could be, you know, 
uh, support ticket resolution. You know, how do I get a support ticket answered? It is really by trying out these technologies. It's not going to be a course in it, which you're going to go learn uh, to learn AI ops because the courses are too company specific. And that's okay. You can learn those things. The first thing is understanding, you know, what can AI do in the area? And I've given you this, this deck as a cheat sheet of what is possible. The second set is, you know, do I have technology my company has already allowed within the company to use that technology to build it or a tool which the company has purchased or even a demo which you can arrange with the uh, uh, concurrence of your IT department to see if those tools work for you. So the second step is really understanding the tools. And the third step is really if you want to build your own tooling in AI, uh, you do have to kind of put in the effort to uh, you know, learn um, which model you're going to use, what programming language Python you're going to use, what kind of data you're going to use. So it really depends on, you know, how much you start um, going up uh, in the ladder, starting from basic understanding to the tools to let me write my own technology to help with it. And this, this is something a ladder a person can certainly uh, climb. Uh, I would certainly, I per let me give you my, my personal thing. I love to use the AI tools available in the market to teach me about AI tools. So if you go open up uh, the browser and open up Gemini, for example, and I'm not endorsing Gemini, but and, and ask questions, how about this? How about this? You know, it'll give you references on how to learn. So I personally like using the internet, using the AI to teach myself new things, what's going on. So, so that was the way I would suggest you start learning about the field, then the tool, then the technology and then build it up. Okay, excellent. Um, and another question is, uh, what are examples of existing AI cloud cost optimizational op op uh, optimization tools? And you might want to um, show your uh, list of references. Um, I, I'm not sure if that list it, has- It does, and actually some of the tools I've put here, but let me give you tools like uh, Turbonomic is actually a great tool. I like personally, I've used it, it it's great. Cloudability is another one. The bunch of tools in this area which do optimization. So go look at some of these links. Uh, I've even given you some people who are looking for tools. I've given, and these are not endorsement. These are just tools which talk about AI being used for that. For example, in security, we got the men.ai for optonomic. We got the AI being used for optimizing. So there are a bunch of references I've given which kind of give you an idea what's going on in each of the areas uh, with the tool set. And that's a good place to learn as well. as to what's the state of the art going on in this area? Okay, excellent. And uh, let's see, last question. Um, how important are processes and people change versus tools for implementing AI ops? Uh, I would say the, the, the main success factor I have seen is the mindset change of the people and the processes being used. Um, there used to be a mentor um, who you should say, uh, a fool with a tool is still a fool. <laughs> what he really meant is you can't fix problems just by giving somebody a tool. You have to change the mindset of how will I change it? What needs to happen end to end from a people perspective, the process perspective, and just tool is just a helper to, to make it. So start with, people acceptance of the problem, people acceptance of what changes need to be brought, and then bring in the tool to help the people transform. That's really the steps you should be taking as opposed to bring in a tool and then say, okay, how do I use this to solve the problem? Do it the other way around. What's the problem? What people need to, to fix the problem? And then how can a tool help people uh, you know, fix the problem? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pratik, for your expertise and insights. Uh, this has been a fantastic presentation with lots of great information, and I really appreciate your time and effort uh, that you spent on this. Uh, so very, very much appreciated. And um, I also want to thank, uh, thank the audience. Thanks for joining us today. And please remember to rate this webinar, as this is very important to get your feedback, which helps us create better educational material. Also, please remember you can always download this presentation and many other items at our educational library, as well as follow us on social media. media. Thanks again to all uh, one more time. Have a great day. Thank you.